Hey guys, welcome back. This is another video in the Automotive Weekly Waveform series. This is going to be week number 21, and today we are gonna cover narrowband O2 sensors and their heater operation. Um, this van next to me has two codes for the rear O2 sensors, um, and it's for the heater circuit. Now I'm suspecting we may have a blown fuse or something because one of the sensors, the wires were rubbed through on the front drive shaft. This is an all-wheel drive van and that's how I bought the van. And all of the wires for that O2 sensor were completely bare and kind of wadded together. I did repair them with connectors, but um, I have a new O2 sensor for it as well. I'm still setting codes for that O2 sensor and the other bank. I'm suspecting we have a problem with the power feeding that heater. Now on our O2 sensors, we have two different portions of that sensor. We have the sensing element, which could be one or two wires, depending on if it's grounded to the exhaust or if it's grounded to the computer. If it's a three wire sensor, then normally two of the wires are for the heater and one is for the signal. And then it uses the body of that O2 sensor to reference ground for the O2 sensor sensing element. If it's a single wire O2 sensor, then it doesn't have the heating element at all. Now we're not gonna cover wideband O2 sensors. That's gonna be for a later series if we even get to it because they're really hard to test with a lab scope. You pretty much can do everything with the scan tool and sometimes a five gas analyzer. So on a narrow band O2 sensor, we have a couple ways that we can control the heater. One way is we just turn the key on, it applies fused power to the O2 sensor heater and then the heater is grounded to the engine block and it's just always on and it regulates itself because the higher the temperature gets, the higher the resistance gets, so it kind of current limits itself. I believe that's how this van is set up, but we will look at the wiring diagram and make sure. The other way is for them to apply fused power to that O2 sensor, and then the computer is gonna control the ground. That gives the computer a couple of ways of checking the O2 sensor. First off, it can check to verify that there's not an open circuit in the heater, and it can check to see if that heater is pulling too much amperage, not enough amperage, if they're running the heater more than they need to. A common one for that's gonna be the Chrysler products, but because Chrysler isn't known for having the best computers out there, um, that part of the computer often fails. You get O2 sensor circuit codes, you replace the O2 sensors, it's still setting codes, it cannot control the heater. Um, normally you have a bad PCM. And then for our sensor signal, we have a reference, which goes back to the PCM, and then we have our signal circuit, which goes back to the PCM as well. And the signal circuit is going to be monitored by the PCM. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna be looking for a fluctuation in that sensor. Now, since we're gonna be checking the rear O2 sensors, our signal is gonna be a little bit different than the front O2 sensors, but that sensor is typically gonna be bouncing back and forth between maybe 0.1 and 0.9. Sometimes you get a little bit above that or a little bit less than that, depending on the year, make, model, and how fast that sensor is operating. The rear O2 sensor, we should see far less activity than the front O2 sensor. The catalytic converter is going to be using up some of that oxygen that's coming from the engine to clean the exhaust a little bit more. It's going to go through a reaction process in there. So we are gonna have a much smoother signal coming out of the catalytic converter than if we measure the upstream coming into the catalytic converter. So you can do this with a one channel scope, but I'm gonna use the Pico four channel scope um, just to save on connection time. We will be hooking up to a couple of the wires, not all of the wires um, at this time. I do have a current clamp and then we're gonna use three voltage channels to check power coming into the heater, our ground for the heater, and our signal circuit for that O2 sensor. Um, I don't normally check it, but sometimes if you're getting weird readings from the O2 sensors, then you might wanna check that reference that goes back to the PCM for the sensor signal ground. Because if that is biased one way or the other, you have a voltage drop across that, it could skew all of your readings a little bit and cause the vehicle to run a little bit rich or a little bit lean compared to what it should be. So let's look at the schematic of the O2 sensor real quick. Not all manufacturers are gonna show the internal part of the O2 sensor, um, but on this GM, we actually do. We have a heater circuit. Now the heater circuit, it looks like a square wave on our oscilloscope. That is our heater grid. The O2 sensor signal is over here. Now, if we look, if we took out this line, this arrow that goes through the middle of that, anytime we have a large flat line and parallel to that is a shorter flat line, um, it typically indicates a battery of some sort. Well, or a power source. 
So we have a line slash going through it or an arrow slash going through it, which indicates that it's a variable voltage generator. Um, or at least that's how I analyze the waveform here. So we have our heater circuit, we have our O2 sensor circuit. Now this one doesn't tell me which one is our reference to ground and which one is our signal circuit. So what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to follow these back to the PC and find out which one is our signal circuit and which one is our reference to ground. Now, since I know GMs, I know that this pink wire on the heater circuit is typically gonna go back to the fuse block. Almost all of the wires that go to a power source to the fuse block are gonna be pink on the GM vehicles. Um, so let's zoom out of here a little bit. We will, uh, we can follow those pink wires real quick just to verify. And see on this page, we have a whole bunch of pink wires all going up here to the fuse panel. And it says O2 sensor B fuse 39. So we have two different fuses. Each of them is running two O2 sensors. So that could be why we have a problem. If the wires that were shorted on the drive shaft pop the fuse, then that could be what's causing both of the rear O2 sensors to not have a heater circuit operation at this point. Now let's go back to the PCM and heated O2 sensor low. That's gonna be our reference to ground. And that shows tan. Let's scroll down a little bit further and we see the purple wire is our high or signal wire. So we're gonna to want to scope that signal wire once we get back to the uh, O2 sensor to verify our signal. Now, this shows NCA or uh, no color available. So they don't know what colors the O2 sensor is gonna be after this connector. That's what the NCA is. Most of these O2 sensors have four wires. Two of the wires are gonna be the same color. They're either gonna be both white or both black, but 90% of the time on the Bosch style and many other manufacturers, you're gonna have two white wires. So those wires are for the heater circuit. And then you're gonna have a black wire, which could be your signal wire, and then a gray wire, which is normally the low reference for that sensor signal. So. You're not supposed to do this, but since I know the wires are damaged on that, I'm just going to use piercing probes. Normally you would want to use back probes into the connector um, so you don't pierce or puncture the wires going to that O2 sensor. Now, real quick on how the O2 sensor sensing element works. We have two thin layers of zirconium. Um, they might have some different suffix after that. And then there's like platinum in between them. There's fresh air or reference air on one side and your exhaust air on this side. The difference between the air, how much oxygen is on the inside versus the outside or inside and outside is going to change the voltage output of that O2 sensor. The lower the voltage on the O2 sensor, the more oxygen is present in the exhaust system. The higher the voltage of the O2 sensor, the lower the amount of oxygen in the exhaust. So high is rich, low is lean, now on the rear O2 sensor, if the catalytic converter is working properly and the O2 sensors are warmed up, a lot of times that rear O2 sensor will hover around 0.7 to 0.8 volts, and it will only fluctuate, dip down every once in a while and come back as it gets a buildup of oxygen and it lets a little bit of oxygen out of the catalytic converter. Um, as we accelerate and decelerate, um, if we're coasting and the, the vehicle shuts off the fuel injectors, we're going to have a lot of oxygen going through the exhaust. There's no fuel, just air. Um, so we're gonna see that voltage drop down. And once we get back on it, then it's gonna jump back up. So since we have O2 sensor heater codes, that's gonna be my primary focus for testing on this vehicle, but we will check the sensor signal as well. Okay, I still have the drive shaft out because um, I knew I was gonna be trying to film this. and I knew that it would be in the way if I installed it. So I repaired the low reference and then one of the heater wires here. This O2 sensor does not match um, the universal style with the two white wires, a black and a gray. Um, these are colored. So I see a tan, it looks like two browns and a purple. Well, our purple wire was the signal wire according to our diagram, as long as these colors are the same as what's on the other side there. I'm gonna assume that our two brown wires are the O2 sensor heater and the tan is our low reference. I'm gonna go throw a low amp clamp around one of the brown wires. And then I'm just gonna use my piercing probe. I don't recommend this on a sensor that you're not gonna change. Um, but I'm just gonna probe the two brown wires and the purple wire. 
I'm going to ignore the low reference wire for now. And then since most of this stuff is reference to the engine ground, um, I'm going to cook my ground up to the transmission case. Um, that's the closest I'm going to get from down here without running a lead up to the cylinder head. But that should be a, a fairly close reference for us. And now we'll jump back up to the computer, get our settings set up, and then cycle the key. See if we get any heater activity, because we should have activity as soon as we turn the key on. And if we don't, um, then we probably have a blown fuse. So with the Pico scope, I typically run more time on the screen. Um, the O2 sensor stuff isn't real fast circuits unless it's a computer controlled heater. And then you're gonna see some pulse width modulation and you might need a little more speed. On a front O2 sensor, we like to see, you know, one oscillation or more per second on a good working sensor. So I like to put a couple of seconds on the screen. If I go to one second per division, then I'm gonna have 10 seconds on the screen when using the Pico scope. Um, if you're using the Snap-on or anything else, you could probably go down to 500 milliseconds or one second per screen buffer. And then it's going to stitch all those together for you afterwards. So you have a little more time available, but you wanna start out with a small amount of time on the screen. Now, I didn't pay attention to what wires I was hooking up to what. So we are gonna be, we're gonna to need to be on a 20 volt scale for our heater circuit, a probably one volt scale for our ground and then the heater ground and then a two volt or so for our signal. I'm gonna throw them all at 20 volts for now. And then channel D is my low amp clamp in 20 amp mode. Now, most of these O2 sensors are only gonna pull an amp or so. Um, so I'm gonna go to a five amp scale just in case that O2 sensor is shorted and is pulling more current than it should. Um, we should be covered there. Um, and just so it makes it a little bit easier for me. The Pico scope has enough speed to zoom back in, but I'm just gonna go two seconds per division. That gives me 20 seconds on the screen. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn the key to the on position, find out if I have power going to that O2 sensor. And I'm seeing a whole lot of nada. Um, we don't have any power going down there. So more than likely the fuse is blown. But what I'm gonna do is just to show you guys why we need the heater in those O2 sensors, I'm gonna start the vehicle up and we're gonna see, I'm, I'm actually gonna add a bunch of time on the screen. We're gonna start the vehicle up. We're gonna see how long it takes for that O2 sensor to actually warm up on its own before it starts gaining activity. That's why we have to have the heater circuit in there is to heat that up as soon as possible to reduce emissions. The older vehicles that didn't have a heated O2 sensor took quite a while to go into closed loop and enable fuel control. So luckily we can see the little mark where I cranked it up, um, a little bit of noise and voltage spike. I should probably <laughs> zoom in a little bit more, but we can see, we'll be able to see what our, you know, signal is once we start getting some activity. And because this could potentially take a while, I'm actually gonna jump in the vehicle and raise the RPM up. Um, that's how you used to test the O2 sensor, make sure it was working on the older vehicles that didn't have a heater, is you just held the RPM at 2000 RPMs for a while to heat up the O2 sensors, and then you made sure that they were switching. So I didn't see really much of anything happening other than some accelerated noise. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. I mean, we're already two minutes in on this, and we were getting hardly anything. Now I know my resolution is poor because I have 20 volts on the screen, but we would be jumping up, you know, into the 700 millivolt, 800 millivolt range if that O2 sensor was warmed up. This is why we have to have that heater circuit in there because we, as emission standards get tighter, we don't have two minutes for this thing to warm up before we enable fuel control. Um, a lot of the new Chryslers, it's like 10 seconds, 15 seconds before the fuel system takes over. So I'm gonna check the fuse under the hood. Um, it's probably blown because the wire was shorted onto the drive shaft. We'll put a new fuse in it and we'll see how long it takes. So the fuse was blown, um, being that it's a Chevy van, the fuse block is difficult to get to and you have to get on nasty because it has hydro boost with leaky lines. But we have a new fuse in there. Let's go ahead and turn the key back on 
we'll find out which wire is our heater power wire and then we will adjust our scaling for the other wires. Okay, we see power. I'm just gonna go ahead and shut the key back off again. I don't wanna warm that sensor up too much before we do our um, test to see how long it takes to respond. So red is going to be my power supply. So all the other ones I can drop down to, I'll just say a, a two volt scale. We'll start recording again. I'm gonna go ahead and just fire it up. We'll see how long it takes for this O2 sensor to start to respond. So our O2 sensor signal is probably that blue wire. I'm suspecting anyways, not sure. Looks like the voltage on the blue wire is starting to rise. And we saw a big spike there. I don't know if it went off the screen or what. And it's back. Not sure, not sure what's going on there. Uh, let's go ahead and pause it. Shut the truck off. So before we had about, we had over two minutes of no activity. Um, this one, I'm not sure why it changed changed so much here, why it went off the screen. Um, I don't know if that was a self-test by the PCM, but from when I started the engine to when the O2 sensor started switching, um, we were at 37, no, 26 seconds. So two minutes of no activity, even with the RPMs raised, and now this one, because it has a heater built in, 26 seconds before it starts responding. Um, I'm gonna change my scaling on that channel a bit just because I'm not sure why it um, went off the screen. And we'll start it up and see what a signal looks like after it's warmed up and running. Okay, I was mistaken on which one was my heater power and which one was my heater ground. Um, so the waveform was kind of confusing. My green, which I had assumed was not my power supply, is my power supply and the red is my ground. Now, I thought that on this one it went to the block, but this one, the ground is controlled by the computer. So what we can see here is we can see, you know, my red channel here is the computer controlled ground. It's pulled the ground and then every once in a while it releases the ground and then reapplies the ground. And um, that's when I get a weird drop in amperage and then it comes back. And my waveform is not quite what I expected to see. So I'm gonna check my amp clamp and make sure that it's still doing okay. Uh, make sure I don't have a low battery because I'm not getting an amperage response like I expected to see. Okay, I am now showing amperage on the amp clamp. Um, there's another wire that was pinched in there holding it open just a little bit. So if you see signals, don't jump to conclusions, check your connections before moving on. Now we can see that even at idle, this O2 sensor doesn't have a lot of activity. Um, it's holding pretty steady, probably around 650 millivolts. I'm gonna go ahead and raise the RPM for a second and then I'll pump the gas pedal a few times and then you know, just manipulate the engine, cause it to run rich and lean a little bit and see if we get a response out of this rear O2 sensor. Okay, so that's pretty much typical activity for the rear O2 sensor. If it was a front O2 sensor, we would see it going rich and lean, rich and lean, rich and lean, bouncing back and forth. Narrow band O2 sensors, don't have the ability to determine how rich or how lean the system is operating. Anything above 400 millivolts is rich. For everything below 450 millivolts is lean, but it's so hard to get uh, an accurate amount on the narrow band O2 sensors. The computer just sees it go above 450, they start pulling away fuel. As soon as it drops below 450, they start adding fuel on the front O2 sensor. On the rear one, we're monitoring the catalytic converter and how much oxygen it can store and how efficient it's being. If we see the rear O2 sensor switching rapidly and it almost identically matches the front, the, rear, the catalytic converter is bad. Um, it's not the rear O2 sensor. The catalytic converter doesn't store enough oxygen for that catalyst process to happen. Um, 
So it's just letting all that oxygen and fuel trim go straight through it, exactly how the front one's reading it. Okay, let's look at the amperage real quick. I'm gonna spread my waveform out so everything's not overlapping. So our red channel here is the PCM control. It holds it to ground, releases it, occasionally holds it back to ground. Our amperage up here, we can see the, a mirror image of that. Um, we have no amperage when the computer releases it and isn't holding it to ground. And then we have amperage once the computer grounds that circuit again. Let's drop a cursor down just to see what our amperage is. Most of them are gonna be around an amp. And that's where we're sitting on this one. We're sitting at just over one amp. Um, now some vehicles may duty cycle this a little bit more. This one's doing a pretty slow job at turning it on and off. Um, but I know that the Chryslers, they'll actually tell you what the amperage is right on the scan tool. Um, so you can look at bank to bank and see what the difference in amperage is. If you have a big difference and you probably have an aftermarket O2 sensor or one of them is failing. On our O2 sensor signal, just to verify that we were able to go rich and able to go lean. I'm just gonna put some measurements here at kind of what the low and what the high was. And we can see here that on our blue channel, we were up to 986 millivolts. And some of that might be noise. If I added some filters, we may uh, have a better result. And then we went down to 81 millivolts. That's pretty good for the range of an O2 sensor. Um, now on the rear O2 sensor, we're normally gonna be hovering around 700, uh, 800 millivolts. Um, during normal operation, if just cruising down the road, if the O2 sensor and the catalytic converter is working properly, um, when you fluctuate the gas pedal, decelerate, make a rapid change in acceleration is when you're gonna notice that O2 sensor go above or below that point. So what I'm gonna do now that I got the exhaust nice and hot is I'm gonna crawl underneath there and replace the O2 sensor. Because I had to crimp a butt connector on that wire, um, I also heat shrinked it, it may cause weird readings and I don't want that. Now I didn't have to do it to the signal wire, it was just on the heater circuit. So it's probably fine, but I would rather be safe than sorry and not have issues with fuel management down the road. Um, I also have a matching set of sensors, so I'm gonna replace the other side as well, because if you put one sensor in, it may read differently or it may warm up faster. This is really, really common on Chrysler's. If it sees, the computer sees that one warm up really fast, it says, okay, we're ready to go, let's start monitoring it. Well, the one that you didn't change might have a slower warm up time. If it's not warmed up all the way and hasn't started switching, then it may indicate that the, to the computer that, hey, we're running really rich over here, we're running really lean. Um, so it starts controlling the fuel trim based off of sensors information that's inaccurate because that sensor hasn't warmed up yet. So if you're doing rear O2 sensors, it's best to change both of them as a pair. Front O2 sensors, change those as a pair, unless it's a very, very low mileage vehicle and you're using factory parts, then you could probably get away with doing just one or the other. So I hope that I covered this well enough for you guys to understand how the O2 sensor works and how we're gonna scope it without leaving out enough stuff to make you guys really confused. Um, if you have any questions or comments, put those down below. If not, you can hold on to the questions till the, uh, the live stream if something comes up, or if you wanna discuss it as a group, you can bring it up there. Um, there's other instructors that go into better detail of how the internals of that O2 sensor work, what the chemical properties are, why it reacts the way it does. Um, but we're not gonna cover that here. We're just gonna cover up how to use the scope, hook up to it, verify that we have heater operation, verify that the O2 sensor signal is within parameters. There is one thing to keep in mind if you're scoping certain vehicles. This vehicle puts a 450 millivolt bias out on the line, but it doesn't really affect our sensor signal once it warms up. Um, Chrysler introduces a voltage onto that O2 sensor that's much higher. Um, I think they run like five volts when you first turn the key on. Once they detect that that O2 sensor is starting to work, they drop that down. And I can't remember if it's one volt or one and a half volt. So on a Chrysler vehicle, you will see a O2 sensor operation still fluctuating within that one volt range, but it's elevated and it's probably sitting uh, on like a one and a half volt bias. So it may drop down to one and raise up to two. Um, or if it's a two volt bias, it'll probably drop down to one and a half and go up to two and a half. Uh, I think that's how it is. It goes one and a half to two and a half, two and a half volts on the Chrysler vehicles. Um, so I'm interested to see what you guys are able to capture. Um, piercing probes, not the best. If you do it, seal up the wires. It's best to use a back probe on the connector. And then 
an amp clamp around the heater circuit. If I did it at the fuse, I would be running the amp clamp to check 202 sensors, so I'd have double the amperage. And I don't know if the computer grounds both of those sensors at the same time or if it alternates them, so you may get a weird signal at the fuse. So it's best to do it at the O2 sensor. Question comments, put those down below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.